Good evening. It's about 6.23 p.m. on a Wednesday evening. The weather is fine. Many of us have made it through a long work day. Others may have made it through a day of uh, relaxing and leisure. Those who are retired have been at the house and doing other various responsibility, but we can all say we made it to the end of another day. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. For those that don't know me, my name is Rodney Smith, uh, Sr. I pastor New Hebrew Missionary Baptist Church, where God has blessed me to be with these great people for almost 14 years now. And just if I can just take a moment just to say to the membership, to the deacons, uh, to the staff, the secretaries, I want to say to all of you that I love you, I appreciate you, and I thank the Lord for you. Uh, there are, I was talking with someone today, and I have seen my share of internal disharmony in a church. And I can tell you here at New Hebron, I, I wish I could say we were a perfect church, but I'm just so glad we don't have to go through some of the storms and internal nonsense that many people have to go through in their home churches. And so to all of you, I take my hat off to you. Uh, I see some of the faces coming on here. I, I appreciate all of your service. And let me just say this. I want to give a shout out. I want to say a word and tip my hat to all of the workers that work behind the scenes at New Hebron. There are so many people doing work with no thought of recognition, no thought of a payday, no thought of having their name in lights. They just have God in their heart. And they want to see the church progress and go forward. Everyone doesn't have that type of motivation and desire. Every church doesn't have people or a mass of people who do that. So I want to say to all of you who are working behind the scenes, who are uh, doing things that many people may not know about, who are checking on this. And many of you have paid for things out of your pocket and, you know, at, at great expense and sacrifice to yourself. More than I can say, I appreciate you. There is a God that sits high and looks low. And one thing we do know, God sees it all. And God will give you the ultimate reward. More than a nod from this person or that person or a pat on the back, God will be the one that will ultimately bless you, if nothing more than just with peace. And, and please let me know, isn't it just a wonderful thing when you can just have peace? Peace is not the absence of problems. Peace doesn't mean that you and your in-laws and your family always get along, although you wish you would. But peace is even in the midst of the storm. You can be like Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. You can sit on your little boat and take a nap. You can have peace because you know it's all in God's hands. So we know that the God that we serve, the God that you work for, the God that you sacrifice for, he sees all and he does reward. God has been in business a long time, and business is good. Uh, to Deacon and Sister Davis, God bless you. To the Moores household, God bless you. To my good friend, Atlanta Hawks, Brother Jamario, uh, good to have you with us. I appreciate all of your consistent support. Uh, to the good sister, the Burnett family, uh, uh, I'm glad to have you all with us. Uh, sister Shavers, God bless you. To Sister Verde Davis, God bless you. And, Hope to have, uh, hope everyone is doing fine and doing well. I had a busy day, but yet and still, I'm just thankful that I have the strength and the health to be able to do uh, to Sister Austin and the Austin family. Reverend and Sister Austin, God bless you too. Um, as we get started with our Bible study Q&A for tonight, the question we're going to cover is, uh, should we pray for the dead? Uh, and that's a, that's a very pertinent question. So I'll get a bit more into that after we have our prayer, but that will be the question tonight. Uh, should we pray for the dead? To my cousin John and his wife Tanya, bless you. I see both of you all on here. Let me say this to you people. Uh, when we come together, whether it be Wednesdays to learn and to study, Sunday morning, Sunday school, uh, Sunday midday, when we have our time of preaching, our sermon series we're currently going through, is entitled the preeminence of doctrinal preaching. But when we go through and come together in times like this to go through the Bible, let me encourage you to take it seriously. Listen, I've been to a couple of funerals the last two weeks. 
And then you hear about this person is sick and you hear about someone in your personal family going through a tough time. And sometimes you may see someone and you haven't seen them in a while. To the Tim's family, God bless you. You, you see them and you can see them beginning to get a little bit older. The, the steps are a little bit slower. The hair is not uh, chalk or, or dark black like it used to be. It's, it's salty gray. The, the steps, the eyesight isn't what it used to be hearing. Let me just tell you, we need to be thanking the Lord for having another day on top of dirt. Let me tell you that. Now, I know people wake up and they're in a bad mood and they say, well, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I'll say this again at the risk of repeating myself. I've examined my bed and my bedroom. I have not found a bad side to get up on yet. Any day on top of dirt is a good day. Make it a good day. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you deal with it. You will have trials. You will have struggles. Christians get cussed out. Christians get lied on. Christians have been robbed. Christians have been fired for no just reason. But guess what? We have a God that's still seated on the throne. So let me encourage you, trust him. Take these times seriously. We just don't know if this will be our last. I don't know when my day will come, but I do know my day will come. Everybody that's under the sound of my voice, sooner or later, that warm body is going to turn cold. I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but I'm trying to let you know the reality that one of these days we will not have the, opportun the opportunity that we have right now. Seek the Lord. Trust the Lord. Follow the Lord. Serve the Lord. Obey the Lord. Talk with him. Walk with him. Because this may be the last opportunity that some of us may have. So let me just encourage you to stay close with God and take these times of Bible studies seriously. So if you don't mind, uh, if you don't, let's, let's take a moment. We're going to have us a prayer, and then we're going to go into our question for tonight. We have various scriptures to go over. So please, ma'am, please, sir, have your Bibles with you. Take a moment, if you can, to pause what you're doing. Let's have us a word of prayer. Let's pray together, saints. Father, we, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we are thankful for all of your goodness, all of your grace, all of your mercy, all of your kindness, all of your provisions, all of your protection. Lord, we could go down the list of what you have done to be good to us. We've coined the phrase, an old earthly proverb, you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. As we come together for the purpose of study, to answer someone's particular question, and Father, there may be many who may not have clarity on this particular subject, we pray, Lord, that you would give us guidance, that you would give us understanding, that you would help us once we see what your word says to come underneath it and to be obedient, not to try to adjust your word to what we think and feel and desire, but to change our thoughts, our feelings, our desires to be subordinate to what your word says. Feed us until we want no more. And we do all of this to the end, not that people can know my name, not that New Hebrew can have a bigger name, but that we can all know your name that we can know more about you, have a closer walk with you. And so, God, we ask you this in the name of Jesus. And they all said, amen, amen, and amen. I'm going to say this as we start. Uh, the, the question tonight, should we pray for the dead? There are some people who uh, may have this question or have had it in the past. There may be some who have not even considered it or thought about it. Uh, before we go any further, I want to kind of give a disclaimer, as it were, uh, that whenever we begin talking about such a serious subject as death, um, especially when we have to shape our view of death based on what the Word of God says, whenever we shape uh, or go down a road of such a serious subject, I want to do it tenderly. I want to do it uh, humbly and meekly. I want to do it with a lot of consideration in mind. Sister Walla, God bless you. Sister Davis, God bless you. Sister Sandra Davis. I want to do it with a bunch of sincerity in mind, consideration. Because even though we're talking about a theological subject, a biblical subject that God has spoken about, because we speak of death, 
it is normally in a person's mind attached to someone they love, they care for dearly. A sibling, a child, a parent, a spouse, uh, someone close to you at work. So I don't want to trample over this subject roughly, inadvisedly, uh, obnoxiously, and in some way offend the sensibilities that someone may or may not have. So I want to give you that disclaimer that my goal is in no way to be demeaning or condemning. My goal is to point us to what God's word says. And the one thing that we can all hopefully agree on is that when you go through God's word, when you know what his word says, when you see truth, we are then expected as God's people to become subordinate to that truth and to change our lives, our expectations, and our desires. So our subject for tonight, it won't be too long at all, but we do have selected and various scriptures to go by. And the question was posed, should we pray for the dead? Is that good? Is it bad? Is it an arbitrary subject and or question? So what I wanted to do first, which is uh, at least advantageous to me, is to define the terms. Well, most of us know what it means to be dead, but what is a, a more textbook, technical, definite, particular definition? When we speak of death, we speak of cessation, halt, conclusion of bodily life. I say bodily life for a reason because we'll get to the rest of it. Death is the stopping, the cessation, the halt, the ending, the conclusion of bodily life and we can even add to that, it is the separation of the soul to the body or from the body. Now, the Bible has many various examples, many various texts and scriptures that relate to death. And I want to give you just a few of them to form uh, and shape the discussion and to shape our mind into the direction that we're going in. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 2, just the A portion. It talks about there is a time to be born and there is a time to die. We see the ecclesiastical writer uh, placed pen to parchment under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and gave us that information. The author of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, he says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this comes the judgment. Now, 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 I want you to understand Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It's appointed unto man once to die. After that comes the judgment. You see, you die once in, in a, in a literal, literal sense, physical sense, I'll say. You, you die once. So the people who have claimed to have died and come back, they have died twice and come back. That is not scriptural. Uh, I don't want to get into anyone's individual claims. That's not up for me to defend or to tear down. I'm only going to tell you what thus says the Lord. You die once, and after that comes the judgment. Now, someone else who claimed to have died and to come back, it is then upon them to verify that claim. But according to Scripture, that doesn't happen. There is no, uh, what do they call that in that religion, where you come back as something else. Uh, I forgot what it's called, where you die and then you come back as something else. You die, you come back as someone else. No, ma'am, no, sir. You die once, and after that comes the judgment. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. One of my favorite passages, if you can have a faith, reincarnation. Thank you, Sister Tim. One of my favorite passages as it relates to the death of Christians John the Revelator says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write. Write what? John says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, says the Spirit, for they will cease from their labors, and their works do follow them. So that may give you a different perspective on Christians dying. It's a blessing. Not just to die, but to die in the Lord. Why? Because all this stuff will be left behind. All of these hard times, all of these difficulties, they will all be left behind. We cease from our labors and our works, they do follow us. And so with this, we can see the Bible, and there are many other verses we could pull from 
Jesus died. <laughs> and Lazarus died. So we can see there are many other verses and situations to pull from, but we wanted to shape our understanding to see the scripture does talk about death. Now, one thing that comes up as it relates to death, many people have brought to me, is the teaching about purgatory. Uh, the Bible does not teach anything about purgatory. Purgatory, it's a, it's a Roman Catholic teaching about a place, a, a, a holding place where the souls of believers go to be further purified from sin until they can be admitted into heaven. The Bible does not have a shred of scripture to support something like this. The Bible speaks and knows nothing of purgatory. It is a Roman Catholic teaching and they have found support in extra biblical, non biblical, non inspired, man written writings, not from the closed canon of the 66 books of the Bible that we have. There is nothing in the Bible that speaks of when you die, before you get either to heaven or to hell, there's a pause, there's an intermission, there's a holding place where you can get better, get purified, and then you can kind of be called on up. No, no, there's nothing. The Bible knows nothing uh, about that. So what happens when we die? Two things happen. Two major things happen, I'll say. And this does relate to praying for the dead. Two major things happen. One, as an unbeliever, you have a different uh, result. As a believer, you have a different result. Unbelievers immediately upon their death go into eternal punishment. Believers immediately upon their death go into the presence of God eternally. Scripture is clear. Scripture is plain. There is no do-over. There is no holding pattern holding place. There is no talking to somebody. It's Listen, you die once, after that you are then judged. Believers instantly go into the presence of God. If you are not a Christian, not a follower of Christ, instantly you go into eternal punishment. Now listen, I can't soft pedal that to appease the culture and the desires of the world. The Bible says what it says God means what he said. God did not stutter. He did not murmur, especially on a subject as serious as this. Now, we don't have to turn there, but in Luke chapter 16, we have a very good parable that can bring to light about the two different destinies of Christians and non-Christians, believers or non-believers. It's the parable about the rich man who was nameless and the poor man who was a beggar named Lazarus. And so when, when you read through that story, there's a section, verses 22 to 28, but, but when you look at how in life the rich man had everything he wanted and desired, but there was a poor man just outside his gates, a beggar named Lazarus, and body was filled with sores. He even yearned to eat the scraps of food that fell from the rich man's table. Now, now, you have to put that in context when you read it. It wasn't saying that they just took food and threw it out of the way. But during the culture of the Jews and the Greeks at that time, they didn't have napkins. They didn't have these nice handkerchiefs we might put around our neck like a Joe's Crab Shack or someplace like that. What they would do as they were eating, they would take bread. And they would take the bread and they would rub it in their hands, some kind of bread, and they would use that to clean all of the debris and the food and the sauce and juice that was on their hand. Well, as they would do that, it would hit the table and hit the floor. Well, who would clean the floor? Not the maids, but the dogs would. Dogs would be in the house. Many dogs at that time would come and they would eat the food that was on the floor. The poor man was in such dire straits, such a difficult time. He said, I would love to even have the food that the dogs eat under the table just to show just how low he was. 
And we saw when the rich man died, he lifted up his eyes in hell. And when Lazarus, the poor man died, he was in Abraham's bosom, a synonym for heaven, being eternally in the presence of God. But the souls of unbelievers, they immediately go into the presence of eternal punishment, eternally separated from the presence of God. Now, friend, let me tell you, that would be the most wretched, horrifying thing to have happened to anyone. Now, now pay attention. Because death is final, because death is certain, and upon our death, if we do not have a relationship with Christ, if we have not surrendered to him as Lord and Savior, anyone who has not done that immediately goes into the presence of eternal punishment. That's why going to the nursing homes is important. That's why when we would go into the street to knock on doors, to evangelize and witness, that is important. That's why raising your children in the fear and discipline and admonition of the Lord is important. That's why helping to witness to people and share Christ and share the gospel with them is important. Why? Because the eternal destiny of individuals lies in the waste. This world is not our ultimate home. This world, it's not the end. I've heard people say a phrase, I think it comes from a song, I'm living my best life. If you're living your best life now, then that means you're not going to heaven after this. Your best life for the Christian is not right now. Your best life for the Christian will be after you die. And we get to go to what the seniors will call the land of no more. No more crying, no more death. No more pain, no more eyeglasses, no more bills, no more murder, no more lies, no more rumors, no more misunderstanding, no more sickness, no more tears because he'll dry the tears from our eyes. So our best life is not now. If you're living your best life now, that's a sign your best life is not to come before the Christian. I don't care how wonderful God has allowed you to live, how many comforts he's afforded you. Paul says it best, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. So unbelievers, when we die, when they die, I'll say, go immediately into the presence, uh, immediately, excuse me, into eternal pain and torment, eternal punishment. But for Christians, that die. The souls of believers go immediately into the presence of God. Now, these two fundamental facts is what's going to help shape and inform our answer to the question. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, a uh, passage that's very special to me, one that, one that has much meaning to me. Turn in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So to turn a good evening to you. Now, what I want us to do, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Now, this kind of fills us in. This is the Apostle Paul filling in our theology. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he's done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Now just walk with me very uh, carefully and very thoroughly through verse 10. He says, you see, for we and all, and then even further in the verse, he says, everyone, we, all, everyone. Well, somebody can say, well, who was he talking about? Well, see, this is where context, context, context comes into play. 
Remember, students of the Bible, remember how I will always teach you, how I would always tell you and try to model for you. If you just go to a certain verse without getting the context often of the previous verse, the, the, the latter verses, the previous chapter, the latter chapter, you're in danger of taking that text out of context. So who is the we? Who is the all? Who is the everyone? Well, Paul has been talking about it throughout chapter five. This, I'm going to use the word we just to inform our understanding. The same we who in verse one have an earthly house of a tabernacle that when it's dissolved, we have another building of God, a house made not with hands that is eternal in the heaven. The same we who in verse five of this same chapter has the earnest of the spirit. We have the down payment of the Holy Spirit, meaning I'm giving you the Holy Spirit to dwell in you now as a promise that it'll be greater things to come later. The same we who in verse six, who are absent from the body and are then present with the Lord. Another reference that when Christians die, not non-Christians, but Christians who have the earnest of the spirit, Christians, when we die, we immediately go into the presence of heaven. So he's talking about the we and the all and the everyone that is absent from the body when they die, but they're present with the Lord. The same we in verse seven, who walk by faith and not by sight. The same we uh, in verse eight again, absent from the body is present with the Lord. He's talking about Christians. Listen, Paul, further than that, God says this is not going to be the destiny, the destination of everyone. There is a different destination, a different destiny for the non-Christian. But, oh, there's a glorious future. There's a beautiful hope for those that believe in Christ. Listen, I can't make that softer on the ears of a world that doesn't want to hear that. God means what he says, and he says what he means. This is for the Christian only. It is not my job, any minister's job, to try to get to a funeral and preach somebody out or in. Their destiny is settled upon their death based on their yes and their no to the Lord based on their yes and their no to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how moral a person is, how giving a person is, how funny a person is, how personable a person is, how nice a person is. If they have not surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, they do not have this destiny. So in verse 10, he said, we all, he said, we must Meaning it's going to happen. This is one appointment that you will not miss. This is one appointment that you cannot get out of. This is one that I don't care if you are timely or irresponsible with your time. You're going to be here. God will see to it. He said this must happen. Furthermore, it's going to happen. For we must all, look at the next word, appear. Now, when it says appear, it's a Greek word that doesn't just mean to be there or to show up. It's a Greek word that doesn't just mean like, well, I was there. I was listed. My name was on the roll. No, it actually means to be unveiled. It actually means to be undressed. It's, it gives the appearance or the understanding in the mind, at least what God is trying to get to us, to where everything you said or done or thought or harbored in your heart, it's all going to be shown. God knows it. God sees it. It's all going to be laid out in front of him. Guess what? You can't run. You can't hide. <laughs> there, there will be no manipulation. There will be no deception. There will be no misunderstanding. God sees and aware of it all. Now, I've heard people use this phrase, God knows my heart. You know, and that is a true statement. 
Many times people kind of abuse that phrase to get out of doing something that maybe they feel they should do. So they use the phrase as a loophole. Well, God knows my heart. I know I ain't going to church, but God knows my heart. I know I don't read my Bible, but God knows my heart. I know I don't pray, but God knows my heart. I know I don't really have an appetite for teaching. I don't have an appetite for doctrine, but God knows my heart. The truth is, God does know your heart. So here's the question. What's on your heart? <laughs> that's, that's what we need to be examining internally because you can't examine somebody else's heart. But guess what? You better take some self-inventory because he does know your heart. And in this meeting, everything that's on your heart, it's going to show up. God will examine you. God will look at you. God will see past the fancy words, past the nice clothes. It, it, it's not so much a literal being vulnerable as if you're unclothed in a sense. It, it gives the understanding that everything that you have done and said, all of who you are cannot be hidden from him. For we must all appear before the what? Judgment seat of Christ. Now, please understand this. This is not standing before a judge in a courtroom to see if you are innocent or guilty. What did the lawyers for the O.J. Simpson trial say? If, you, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. It's not that type of judgment. This is not a judgment to see if you're going to heaven or if you're going to hell. No, no, no. It's, it's not that type of judgment. This is the judgment to where God will look at you as a stewardship of everything he has given to you. What kind of steward have you been? What kind of steward have you been with your time? What did you do with your 70 years, your 80 years, your 90 years, your 100 years, your 50 years? What did you do with the talent he gave you? Oh, you could sing. God gave you that voice, but you didn't want to use it for him. You had other reasons. He gave you the ability to organize, but you didn't want to do it in some way to advance ministry and building the kingdom. You wanted to use it for corporations, but didn't want to use it for the God who gave it to you. What about that patience he gave you? You know they need help with the kids. You have a perfect tone, a perfect pitch, a perfect way with children, but you didn't want to use it. Why? Because getting there early wasn't your thing, and Sunday was your only off day. This is God as if he was the steward of a house who left you certain responsibilities and duties and things that he gave you that you could do, and now he's coming back to see, okay, what did you do? Now, now I, I, I want to advance this point. Imagine if your upbringing was like many of ours, but I'll just say mine. When your mother would leave you at home and she would tell you, do this, do that, don't, you know, long distance, young people, has not always been free. So don't make no long distance phone calls on my phone. Don't have nobody in my house. Whatever she gave you, do this, do that. Well, guess what? Mama's coming home again. Like, mama's going to come home when she gets off work at 4, 4.30, 5, 6. If she works overnight and gets home while you sleep in the middle of the night, guess what? A good parent, a good father, a good mother and father, they're going to inspect what they expect. This is God inspecting what he's been expecting. What did you do with the money I gave you? I gave you all that money, and all you gave me was a tip, not even a tenth. All you gave me was five cents. You know, the, 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 the story told about money about to be burned and the $100 bill been all over the world. The 50, the 20, they've been all over the world. But the $1, he said, y'all ain't saved. I'm a dollar bill. I've been in church all my life. Yeah, because, because people seem to, in general, too many have given God the least, but given the vacation the most. Given God the least, but I spend $500 on a ball dress for a daughter and she ain't going to wear it but one time. Giving God scra uh, scraps and uh, 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 leftovers, but giving the world their best. This is God saying, you're going to stand before me at my judgment seat and I'm going to check to see what you have done with the blessings, the favor, the gifts, all those things that I've given to you. And if you look at the end of the verse, it's only going to fall into two categories, whether they be good 
or whether they be bad. Listen to me, people. The world has tried to manipulate and maneuver and get out from under accountability to God. But for the Christian, on your way to heaven, God said, yeah, you still are going to stand before me. And I'm going to say, you know what? I did a lot or not me. God could say, I've done a lot for you. I've given you a lot. Maybe you weren't rich, but I gave you an intelligent mind. Maybe you didn't have the best intelligence, but I gave you a certain type of patience. Maybe you weren't the most patient, but I gave you this or I gave you that. That's why you hear me say so often, God has given everybody something to where they can be a benefit from, to the church. That's why the Bible knows nothing about a sit on the pew, don't be involved, I guess we could say do nothing type of Christian, pew member. The Bible knows nothing about that because we will stand before him. We will appear before him and God will expect us to give an account of our stewardship of what he has done. How have we handled the blessings, the good things that God has given to us? But, but, but just in, in this one verse and leading up to this verse, even when you look at verse number eight, being absent from the body is to be present with the Lord because when a believer dies, he instantly goes into the presence of the Lord. When my day comes, and I say when because I don't expect to live forever. I shouldn't because I won't. Before my warm body turns cold, I'm already on streets of gold. I'm already with the Lord. Listen, you will weep. Everyone will weep for a loved one, an associate, a church member that, that you miss because they're no longer with you. That's a normal process. Some people don't cry. Some cry a lot. Some cry a little. It's a normal process to miss so-and-so, whomever they may be to you. That's normal. But guess what? Go ahead and weep because you miss them. But if they were a Christian, your tears can be mingled with joy. Because guess what? They've gone from this work. They've ceased from their labors. Their work do follow them. If they were not, that's really a time for weeping. So, so let me see. Should we pray for the dead? Once you or a person has died, their eternal destiny is set. A prayer would not do anything for them. If they are in heaven, what are you praying for? They're in a place that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has entered into our heart and mind what God has given them, what God is exposing them to. What could you pray for that could be better than for them to be with the Lord? Nothing. But if a person is not saved, there's no prayer that you can pray that can ease the pain, the torment of what they are going through. The only way to ease that, to not even minimize that, but to have that not happen would be while they're alive to pray that they know Christ. Because once you die, after you die, Hebrew says, then come to judgment. So should we pray for the dead? No. It, it, it will have no effect in either way. There's, there's nothing that we can do after a person has bodily ceased and the soul is separated from the body. At that point, the only thing that takes place is based on their yes and their no to the Lord. When, when we die, as, as, as touching as it may seem to some, or uh, I'm trying to think of a right word, as beautiful imagery as it may give, you know, but, but when we die, we, we don't get wings. We, we're not angels. You know, when we die, I, I see kind of the phrases, uh, so and so got their wings, or or fly high. We don't we we don't get wings when when we die. The Bible knows nothing about that. That may be a poetical way, a softer way, a more uh, gentle way to think of a deceased loved one. And I'm not trying to tear down anyone's attachment 
to a loved one who's no longer with us. But biblically speaking, we do not get wings when we die. That's, that, that does not happen. The Bible knows nothing about that. So there are a lot of things that we could go into, but to answer the question directly, should you pray for the dead? No, you should not. Praying for them if they're in heaven, you, my prayers for someone who was a Christian and, and who lived a Christian life, who professed Christ as Lord and Savior and tried their best, even though they were flawed, tried their best to grow and to read and to pray and to get better. And you see a pattern of that through the way they treated people and treated you. And when that person goes to heaven, what could my prayer benefit them? They're in heaven. They've reached the ultimate pinnacle of eternity to be with the Lord forever. If a person has not accepted Christ, no prayer can change or undo what they have rejected in their life, which is Christ. You don't go to hell for rape, for murder. You don't go to hell for lying, for stealing. You don't go to hell from, for having sex and you weren't married or being with somebody that wasn't your spouse. These are bad things, awful things, all of them. We can give a list of sins that you should not do, but you go to hell because you have said no to Christ. You go to hell because you have said no to Christ as Lord and Savior. I, I've often said it this way as we get ready to close. If all you do to a person who is unsaved is to help them stop drinking so much, well, that just means they're going to hell sober. Yes, you shouldn't get inebriated and you run off the road and all these, you know, over excessive things that we do. Of course, you shouldn't do that. However, that does not determine heaven or hell. What determines life with the Lord forever or life separated from God forever is did you bend the knee and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you said yes to that, the rest of your life should be an unfolding, a growing, a maturing, a spirituality that unfolds over time. Though some may not be on that road, though some may have flat periods for a long time, if you have in your heart surrendered to Christ, you're going to have it. Now, there's going to be some accountability that will come your way when we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, Christ can say, now, wait a minute now. Oh, I, I've given you a lot. You squandered a whole bunch. But if you did not say yes to Christ, like the rich man, you lift up your eyes in hell. You will forever be separated from the Lord. You will have a body that is suited for torment to where you can feel the flames, feel the pain, but the body does not disintegrate. That is God's justice and judgment against all sin. Well, how can you avoid that? By accepting Christ as Lord and Savior. Listen to me. And I have to say this as we close. Not Buddha. Not Muhammad. Well, somebody could say, well, well, well I thought M M Muhammad and, and, or Allah was the same as God. No. Allah didn't have a son that died on the cross one Friday and rose early the third day morning. That's not in the Quran. That, that, that we, we, we're talking about two different gods. So no, they're not the same. Not Muhammad, not Allah, not Buddha, not Confucius, not Joseph Smith. Listen, not your ancestors. Apart from Christ, you can say not anything or anyone else that you can even think of. Salvation is found in Christ alone. And to have him is to have salvation. So that when you die, your loved ones, although they will miss you, Although they will have a period of transition and difficulty and that pain will linger and only through God's grace and time and prayer does it get better, that, that's all in God's hand. Yes, they'll miss you, but guess what? Their tears can be mingled with joy because they can say, I know mama loved the Lord. I mean, yeah, mama wasn't perfect, but I know she loved him. I know daddy loved the Lord. Maybe he was a little strict. Maybe he, you know, didn't give us the privileges the kids next door had. Or maybe he said we couldn't date as early as my friends could date. But I know daddy loved him because he tried to tell me about the Bible. He tried to teach me the Bible. He tried to raise me in a biblical way. I know my aunt loved him. I know my uncle. The list goes on and on and on. When a Christian dies, it's such a better situation. So 
I'll go ahead and stop right there. That's an excellent question. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, but we do not need to pray for the dead. There's nothing our prayers could do to affect anything. They have a settled destiny based on their yes and no to the Lord. So, so hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully it was beneficial. Uh, let me say to you, please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, continue to be with us as much as you can. Uh, our Sunday school lesson this Sunday morning is coming up. I want to go over it, not go over it. But this Sunday will be coming from uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, how Nehemiah combats uh, derision and danger and, and wonderful book, the story of Nehemiah. Also, Lord willing, this Sunday morning, uh, beginning at 1045, we'll pick up with our sermon series entitled The Preeminence of Doctrinal Preaching. We need doctrinal preaching. What we've gone over tonight some people who's like, man, that's boring, man. I'm so tired of this, man. Can't you get, this is a subject that is necessary, a subject that is needed, a subject that is helpful, a subject that can guide your theology. We need doctrine, sound doctrine. Too much time for entertainment. Listen, time is running short. People dying left and right. We ain't got no time for no you know, funny voices and, 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 you know, I've seen so much stuff. I don't want to go down, down the list. So if you can be with us, please do. And we'd love to have you. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions to our church website, new Hebron, L R dot O R G new Hebron, L R dot org. Uh, let me say this to you. Been messing with my son here. Uh, I'm looking at here. Uh, Deacon Davis, Deacon Margaret Davis and Sister Davis, I've, I've uh, about to be an empty nester here, and I did something good tonight. They'll know this. I done messed around and got me my mama's recipe. I got me some uh, cream of mushroom. Got me the red onions. Mix it up with a little milk in there. <clears throat> then bake me some, some boneless, skinless chicken breast. I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to do better. Got me some rice with broccoli. <clears throat> and look here, a cold cup of water. No soon as I hit the power button, I'm going to tell you where I'm going. And I'll give myself, it's 7 11, 7 12. I'll give myself to 8.03. I'm going to be getting ready for tomorrow. Sleeping just like a baby. I don't, I don't think the sun will be down, but I'll be down. So y'all pray for me. I pray that all of you have as peaceful a night as I plan on having. Because my baked chicken just came out. Thank you, Jesus. I can see the steam right now. Mm, ain't he all right? God bless you. <laughs> God keep you. Sister Tim's. <clears throat> Lady Di, good to have you with us. To everyone else. To the Morris family. To the Milam family. We're about 18 cars over there in the driveway. God bless you too. I pray that everybody stays safe. Uh, I pray that everybody stays blessed. Just keep your hand in God's hand. To the Burnett family, God bless you. And I'll look for you Sunday morning in God's will. God bless you.